Hey, welcome to the Wisconsin Drunken History Podcast. We are your hosts, Eric Sturgeon. And I'm Russell Sorry. This podcast is about all things Wisconsin, history, music, culture, and beer. Although we don't often use strong language, the content is not intended for young audiences, so listener discretion is advised. If you love the bluegrass music you hear in this intro, please check out Dang It's from Madison, Wisconsin by visiting their website, dang-its.com. Now on to the show. All right. Welcome to another episode of, you guessed it, Wisconsin Drunken History Podcast, your weekly dose of the dairy state. We, of course, are your hosts, Eric Sturgeon. And I'm Russ Sari. And uh, today we have another great story. It's about pens. And uh, this is another uh, legendary figure uh, from the state of Wisconsin. And this is uh, George Safford Parker. You probably recognize that name from the Parker Pens. Uh, if you've been into a office supply store like ever in your life, you know, they have the uh, expensive pen section over there. And I'm not saying all Parker Pens are uh, on the super expensive high line, but uh, they do make some really, really great uh, pens and uh, they're definitely a, a noticeable name and noticeable brand in the oh, office yeah. supply. They're the world. Gucci main of pens, man. They like basically the top are. dogs. Yeah, like they're like it's. <laughs> this is top of the line stuff. This is like the Maybach, Louis Vuitton of yeah. pens, dude. It's pretty good. All right, so we also have great Wisconsin music in this episode from the Millbillies. We have a brew review. We have another edition of How Many Locals You At. And uh, we have a special interview with Matt Bray from the Millbillies. So, uh, as always, hey, if you can uh, remember to uh, like, subscribe, rate, review, do uh, all of that stuff on the social media and also whatever streaming platform you use, throw us a little review, thumbs up, hit the bell to uh, be notified when there's new stuff coming out, uh, and and reach out as well. We love hearing from from everyone. Uh, We also love... um, all the feedback that you are uh, able to provide. It really just helps us become uh, better, more proficient. Uh, And then if you guys have ideas for shows or new segments, or Hey, if you've got a, a, an OWI article or something like that, (laughs) we don't like the ones where anybody's hurt or injured, uh, you know, severely. Uh, We don't like the ones where um, outsiders are involved. If it's just a clean kind of, uh, pull over or something like that, or maybe they crashed into a sign or something like that. Hey, and they're fine. And maybe it's even you. We don't say names, so yeah. it's okay. We yeah, can, we, we'll keep it on the low key. We keep the uh, the individual off the record. We might say individuals um, like the the officer's name or something like that. The apprehending, you know, the sheriff or something like that. But you know, we we definitely could use. Yeah, anything you guys have. So yeah, throw it out. Yeah, and if you have bands or anything that you want to suggest uh, that we feature, definitely throw us a line. Um, yeah. So and then we also have a T Public store. So if you go to tpublic.com and you type in Wisconsin Drunken History Podcast, it's going to take you to our exclusive logos and our exclusive items that are in that store. We've got uh, stickers and magnets. Uh, Everything, got, baby onesies, yeah, sweaters, any type of baseball t-shirt, tees. sweatshirt, anything like that. And honestly, we don't make a lot out of it, but it's an extra few bucks here and there to kind of help us pay for some of the fees. Exactly. So. Yeah. It really, you know, we we travel to a few of these breweries in order to get uh, beers. Uh, so it'll pay for a little bit of gas money. It'll pay for a little bit of the show stuff. So, uh, hey, guess what? Let's stop beating around the bush. Let's go ahead and get into the uh, main segment here, George Safford Parker and Parker Pens. All right, so let's get into the story here. So uh, George Safford Parker was born on November 1st in 1863 in Schulberg, Wisconsin, another true native Wisconsinite. Absolutely. He attended college at UIU or the Upper Iowa University in Fayette, Iowa, where he studied engineering. He was known for many things, including being a teacher of telegraphy in Janesville, Wisconsin, industrialist, inventor, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. He also sold and repaired fountain pens in his spare time. He soon became frustrated with the unreliability of pens at the time, and he experimented with different ways to prevent ink from leaking from pens. 
So basically, you know, it's like any engineer. He founds a problem and he uh, tries to improve on right, it. Right, so. yeah, exactly. He, he thinks a little bit differently than the rest of us. You exactly. Know? So in 1888, Parker founded the Parker Pen Company, and a year later, after a ton of tinkering, they received his first patent. Five years later, he also received an additional design for his Lucky Curve feed, which this patent was used all the way up until 1928. So it was like the best technology at that time for pens. Is that a way for the ink to roll through to like the ball? Was, yeah, was, were these even ball points then? Or? Um, they're still kind of more of your fountain pen, but okay. they weren't like your quill and ink. You know, they're like they're moving up. So there's some fountain technology still happening where it's like a cartridge and it's leaking down to the pen tip. Yeah. But it's not getting all over the place. Gotcha. So... By 1908, his factory located on Main Street in Janesville became the largest pen manufacturing facility in the entire world and quickly gained a reputation of being the premier top pen brands and one of the first companies to have a global presence in the entire world. He even traveled abroad to show and gain distribution, which he enjoyed seeing all the new scenery. Uh, from 1920 to 1960, before the development of the now more commonly used ballpoint pen, he remained the largest producer of writing instrument manufacturers. One of his more famous pens of the, t of the period was called the Quick or Quick Drying Ink, which was created in 1931. And it completely eliminated the need for uh, bl uh, blotting the pen, like dipping. Yeah. Like, and I can also imagine that this really helped out left-handed writers. Oh, probably. Be I mean, because if you think about it, if your if your hand is going over what you're what you've just written as a left-handed uh, person, uh, quick drying ink is like the only way that you probably could survive at this point. Yeah, probably. I mean, there's there's not a lot out there for technologies at this point. Probably. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Like you said, this was early 1900s, mid or mid 1900s <laughs> yeah. at this point. Yeah. So in 1941, he came up with the most commonly distributed and used pens in fountain pen history, which he dubbed the Parker 51. It ended up making it making the company uh, $400 million through its 30 years of being being made on the uh, like being manufactured. Yeah. Um, Parker had done so well and, and acquired multiple companies that in 1973, they bought the uh, company Norm Thompson and owned it all the way up until 1981. And that was like a mail order company, uh, which sold things to compete with Sears and Roebuck. And he was able to feature the pen in there, which helped his distribution even more. I mean, when you got those catalogs back then, there's no internet, right? You don't have Amazon. Right. You look at the Sears catalog, the JCPenney's catalog, you know. And the reason for those catalogs was that the... I mean, unless you were living in the biggest city in your state, you probably didn't have uh, a really big store like this. Exactly. And so they were able to distribute these catalogs and then eventually make it to your house. It's not two day delivery or one no, day delivery. This is a two to three week, this possibly is like, longer. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> And he also bought Manpower in 1976, which is actually still around today. It's one of the main staffing agencies. Exactly, yeah, it's which a staffing is agency. Pretty impressive for somebody like that because Manpower is like all over. And the Manpower group now is is massive. It is. It's huge. Yeah. So in 1981, the company introduced the Parker RB1 or Rollerball One, which was the precursor to the Parker Vector. It was a rollerball pen with a simple cylindrical plastic cap. In 1984, they introduced the FP1 or Fountain Pen One, which kept the same design, just different ways to distribute the ink. The RB1 and the FB1 were made all the way up until 1986. Hey, the year I was born. That's crazy. Wow. In 1986, they changed the design of the pen by making a longer cap and a shorter barrel, calling it a vector standard. And Parker Pen moved to New Haven, East Sussex, England in 1987. And uh, they were still operating in Janesville, but they also had a facility over there. It's more what it was. But I think their main headquarters... Like for manufacturing purposes yes, or Yes, okay. yep, exactly. Just to help with distribution into the uh, European market. Oh, sure. And sure. I mean, the European market at that time was exploding. I mean, there's a lot of rich countries in Europe at this time. So these people are buying these pens left and right. Yeah. You know? Speaking of exploding, do you think that Parker also had anything to do with the pocket protector to help from exploding pens? I don't know. They should have. I mean, right. it would have been a great technology for him to yeah. develop, honestly, because I've had some explode my <laughs> pants, and it looked like I had a... I remember in high school, Oof. this kid used to chew on the ends of pens, and all of a sudden, he, he looked down, like he tasted something weird in his mouth. I looked oh. over at him, and I was like, dude, you got blue ink all in your mouth, all over your face. 
and you he know, was like, "Oh man, the pen just exploded in my it, mouth." <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's crazy because those things are kind of they're not pressurized highly, but they have like a little piece. If you ever look into the tube, there's, there's a little, like a piece of glue or something. Yeah, it's a little top. piece that's just holding all that in there. So yeah. if you break that, it's it it literally just comes right out. Right, really, it's, it's like, a liquid. It's, it's literally like a pressurized thing, so it stays down at the bottom. But if you let that and go, to move the ink and downward <laughs> instead of <laughs> chop that sucker down. Yeah. So long, baby. You're going to turn into a Smurf. This just means so. don't buy Bic pens. <laughs> yeah. In 1993, the Gillette Company bought out Parker Pen and owned it all the way up until 2000, where it was again passed on to the uh, Newell Rubbermaid Company. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. The huge company. I mean, Rubbermaid. They, yeah. yeah. It was largest, who is the largest distributor of writing instruments. And uh, they, as they own like Waterman, Liquid Paper, Sharpie, Prismacolor, Papermate, and uh, like m- most of the other big names you're going to hear in the pen making yeah yeah and they actually to this day they still do own the parker name um and you can still buy parker today and they come in about four models that are still available they got a fountain pen a capped roller ball push point ball or a push button ball point and a push button pencil so these are the ones you can still buy they're still top notch i mean they're not as handcrafted probably as they are they're more factory made at this point but i mean they're still great pens and so i think staples went primarily to uh, like an online ordering service, but I think Office Max and Office Depot still exist. Yeah. If you get a chance, go to one of those office supply stores, go back to the pen section and just take a look because they do have like locked cases of pens and other writing instruments where the cases, uh, meaning the, the, the pen outer case that holds the, the cartridge, like you said, uh, those cases come in like hard bo- hardwood boxes. They're nice. They are like steel cases. They're absolutely lavish. Uh, they they have a good weight to them, so they feel nice when you write. Uh, a lot of technology goes into that. And then, honestly, the cartridges to refill those pens, uh, it, uh, they're far less expensive than the initial purchase of the, the outer casing writing, you know, instrument yeah and that's actually just about the state that's like in 2012 is when they induced uh, introduced that refillable cartridge that eric is talking about yeah and uh it, it's really nice because you can you, you know you, you don't have to worry about a pen being disposable this one's reusable you can buy the cartridges put it in there good to go again for a while so i mean they're great pens i mean i i wish i was in that market bracket where i could afford them you know i but yeah. they're i mean they're a little expensive for somebody yeah. like me to buy a pen but uh, yeah, they're great pens and we highly recommend them. So the original plant that was owned by George S. Parker uh, was closed in, uh, and in 2012, the main Janesville plant was shut down and uh, his New Haven facility closed in 2011 and moved to St. Herblain, France. So the one in Janesville is currently like, I think it's a workforce development thing right now kind of thing. Okay. And uh, yeah, the one in Sussex is closed, but now, like I said, it's, it's more of a factory produced product, but it's still a good product. I mean, it's and it's not owned by the Parker family anymore, but sure. And and to be fair, it still utilizes, uh, you know, his original ideas. His exactly. patents are still the thing driving the 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 pen technology there. So, uh, even though you're not putting any money directly into the back into the state of Wisconsin. Uh, you can at least uh, have a good story to tell when you're holding that Parker pen and somebody oh, might sure. ask you, hey, that's a nice pen. And uh, you can give them a little bit of history now. Yeah, and those that don't tune into our, uh, you know, our social medias or whatever, we have some really cool videos coming out for the Parker Pen Company. So you guys got to stop over there and you check might, us out. You might have already seen them because the episode, we usually do our teasers right. a few days before. Uh, but if for some reason you, you didn't check it out or you didn't see it, uh, definitely go back to either Facebook or Instagram is where we yeah. post most of this stuff. I suggest following us on both. And, uh, and we definitely do. Uh, we, we put some really cool teasers, exclusive photos and videos and old uh, uh, interviews, uh, old commercials and stuff, too. Yeah, just really, really cool historical Wisconsin things on there. Uh, but I'm going to conclude this episode today. And uh, George Safford Parker died on J- July 19th of 1937 at the age of 73 in Chicago area where he is actually buried today. Even today, though the Parker uh, factory has been closed in Janesville, it's still celebrated in the Rock County area. And uh, th- there's a high school named after him, the Parker High School, or originally called the George S. Parker High School. I, I was going to say, I know, I know, I remember it as George S. Parker when we were playing sports in school. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but they've they've really kind of shortened it to Parker High School, I think. 
right? Yeah, I, I remember in high school I dated somebody who was from Parker for a short time. I feel like, terrible for you. Oh, uh, right. <laughs> I'm kidding. Because <laughs> they were on the Janesville team. Yeah. Honestly, though, I, I wasn't a huge fan of my hometown mascot. Let's be honest. It's pretty lame. I mean, compared to, like, some of the other cool ones out there. Elmer Elk, right, or something like that? It's something. It's an elk. Yeah. I mean, like, dude, how freaking tough is that? That's better than the uh, Whitewater Whippets. Oh, yeah. A a puppy dog. A racing dog. dog. Cute little puppy dog. Oh, cool. Hey, cute puppy dog. Yeah. I'm not going to do anything. Yeah. (laughs) We're not even going to beat you. But, all right, that's going to conclude our main episode. Now on to the music segment. All right. So we have a very, very awesome music segment. Uh, the, the, The artist today also kind of doubles as our interview later in the episode. So uh, we're talking about the Millbillies. Uh, Once again, Russ and I have have had, we've had the the greatest of the great uh, uh, musical uh, artists, especially in that kind of bluegrass uh, and folk kind of genre. And once again, you know, we're just blown away by the musicianship and, and the quality of the tunes from, uh, you know, from especially the Millbillies, again, you know, we've we've had a lot of uh, contact and communication with them, and I'm just absolutely floored. I, I love everything that they've put out. Yeah, the, they just released a new album, and it was, like, hard to go through track by track and find the best one. It was so tough. I don't know about you. I was listening to that thing back to front, and i like, I don't know which one we're going to choose. Right. I, really, I really don't. And, and So they, good. The, the, the age-old saying of, you know, you don't have a favorite child yeah i don't know you know when you're when you're going through here and you got to pick one i can't play the full album on this show so trying to to pick every time the best one you know at the at the same time what ends up happening is i just picked the one that i kept kind of coming back to the one that i hummed the one that i kept kind of finding was stuck in my head and uh the one that we landed on uh is a song called hoods uh, and uh, it is absolutely fantastic. But again, I encourage any any of you to go out and listen to all of what the Millbillies have to offer uh, because you're not going to be disappointed. If you enjoy this type of music or if you just enjoy music in general uh, and, and you're a musician and you can kind of appreciate the, uh, the art itself, uh, the discipline that it takes to kind of formulate one of these songs, it's absolutely amazing. So... Uh, without further ado, here is Millbilly's Hoods.
of your lead You could call her honey if you had more money Cause that's all this ward ever needs At the market for brunch, she's packing up a punch Brown curls are ready to kill Orange juice and champagne, she'll forget your name The moment she hands you the bill Cause you don't want me I absolutely love the ending to that. With that was that phenomenal. Uh, again, everybody, that was the Millbillies and uh, Hoods. What's really cool about that song is if you double back, you go back and listen to it a little bit, what they're talking about is some of the neighborhoods in the city of Milwaukee, uh, which is really cool. It starts off right away, and they're like, uh, you know, something on Brady, they'll get you a lady or whatever. They're talking about the east side of Milwaukee on Brady Street, which is where... Some really fantastic eateries are and uh, some really cool local shops. Uh, exclusive company uh, where you and I yeah. went to uh, Taking Back Sunday to see uh, a little exclusive acoustic performance, which is technically where I met my wife. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's crazy. Uh, neat little side story. Uh, a few weeks before I actually met my wife, uh, Russ and I went to the exclusive company on the east side uh, for a acoustic performance from the band Taking Back Sunday. And Russ and I were front row. We were face-to-face with Adam and uh, John. And at one point, I even had a conversation. Oh, yeah, about Brave New World. About Brave New World, yeah, uh, Aldous Huxley, and like a bunch of different like really cool stuff. Oh, and then um, the Mandela Effect. Remember I brought up? Oh, yeah, up that's right. The Mandela Effect and, you know. Yeah, it was an awesome show. It yeah. was so cool. So a couple weeks later, fast forward here, I'm chatting with my wife, my now wife. I'm chatting with her online and uh, mentioned that, you know, hey, we were just recently at a Taking Back Sunday show because the only thing I saw on her profile was that she was a big fan of um, the, the band Brand New, which, I mean, I know that not a lot of our fans are probably super into this pop punk post, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, one of the guys from Brand New actually used to be in in Taking Back Sunday. They had a little bit of a falling out, whatever. She said she liked that, and then all of a sudden, when I brought up that we had gone to a Taking Back Sunday show, she was like, I was at that same one. There's actually a picture that the exclusive company took and put on their website, and you can see not only Russ and I at the front of this the stage, you can see my wife in that picture <laughs> it's as so well. so cool, man. Which is rad because, like I said, it was literally only three weeks before her and I... Uh, started dating and talking about that area too dude how many times have you been drunk at nomads watching oh, soccer yeah, and just times. getting shit faced yeah getting a, a sig a pbr and a shot of uh oh, you jameson got, dude, you for, have to do that if yeah, you go yeah. I mean. um awesome stuff uh that song just reminds me of a lot of really cool things uh from my personal experiences in the city of milwaukee just a ton of memories man yeah, yeah. Just, and it's done in such an artful way with uh, some of the absolute best musicianship i've i've heard in uh in bands so awesome song check them out now we have a beer review and let me tell you this thing is extra oh so special uh this is a collab beer russ why don't you tell us a little more yeah so this is a collaboration beer uh it's actually mobcraft who we just had on one of our episodes um Oso, and actually uncle mike's bake shop and uh, this one is called the Kringle Monster. It is an imperial pastry stout with sea salt, caramel, pecan, Kringles, and pecans. You? Yeah, it is phenomenal. Like, and I'm gonna read off the can real quick, just so you can kind of s- hear the little description on there. It says, "Also, Mobcraft and Uncle Mike's Bake Shop present Kringle Monster." Gorge yourself on scrumptious pastry stout oozing with sea salt, caramel pecan, kringle goodness. Om nom nom. And oh my Mm, God, is this... mm, mm. It's phenomenal. (laughs) It actually, like, you know what? It tastes like a stout with a kringle back finish. It is phenomenal. Like, you get that, you get that, like, um... That stout, almost that coffee from the dark malts. Right, right. But then you're getting that, like, sweetness up front from that, uh, that pastry itself. It's coming through really good. 
Um, the can has oh a real. Oh my god, that is so good. It is so delicious. The it's can chocolatey and like. Oh my god, it's like it's a, got a caramely coating. It's uh, like, to the mouth feel. It's a it's a complete dessert beer. Yeah. It is phenomenal. And on the on the can's awesome too because it actually has Kringles on there and like a little devil dude in like a little uh, striped red suit. Just, and he he looks like he has absolutely just gorged himself with yeah. some of the finest Kringles. Yeah, he's and got a fat belly, fat gut. And Mobcraft, let me tell you, makes some phenomenal beers. I mean, we've had quite a few myself. They make a lot of craft um, special. Um, crowdsource stuff too, I believe. Even and, yeah, the, so a lot of these the the breweries here in in Wisconsin do phenomenal collaborations, and and you know that see the thing that I like and that we've talked to you know, how many different breweries in the state of Wisconsin on this show, and all of them have really great things to say about their other brewing buddies, which is awesome. And this one in in particular tells a. a a perfect story of how they they work together because it's brewed at the Mobcraft facility. But I'm I'm sure you know Oso sent uh, you know two or three of their finest uh, brewmasters to work with Mobcraft to really you know delicately and precisely build this recipe uh, to make it taste as great as it does. And it is like I said, chocolatey. It's got that richness that you want, and then it also has this beautiful like stout flavor yes and i i didn't talk about this um in the beginning but uh this one is actually nine percent abv so it's high so it's a up swift there. kick to the nuts is yeah what it is. you know what you, you know don't know it really crazy is this one just tastes like you're eating like a dessert or having like a dessert drink so you can't even really tell that it's nine percent it's not alcohol well, so you could just get wrecked well the thing is is that too and I, correct me if i'm wrong you're more the brew master uh in this partnership I'm more of the taster slash uh, muscle. <laughs> yeah. You know, oh, if, no. If you, you, you want me to pick up or you want me to hold the thing while we, well, you know, while we drain the, you know, whatever. Yeah. 15 gallons. I'm going to be honest. That's a lot of heavy grain. And, and I mean, and I'm, you hold I'm it a, for a while. Yeah. You got to hold it up while it sifts through. So it's heavy. Yeah. Let's be honest. So I, I don't know if I'm going to be spot on with this, but with, uh, with these stouts like this, the bitterness units are not there. You don't have the same as what you have it's very in an low. IPA or a double or, you know, something like a hazy. Yeah, it's it's very low. What's probably driving up a lot of this um the the alcohol volume is all the sugar from the, the pastries that were added on. Exactly. The A B V, the sugar is is what the yeast is turning into alcohol exactly so yeah obviously they're gonna still have like a malt like a um a dark malt right like a really dark caramel um because you're getting that caramely flavor so you're using some darker malts that are roasted a little longer but, but not too long and that's what i like about it is that um I'm, I'm not gonna name names uh to call anybody out but there are some stouts and some darker beers that can almost have a burnt i've had a few yeah, yeah for sure and here's the thing it's a little bit harder to perfect these beers than it is to do just like a uh, some sort of a, an IPA. Like you and I, we really focus on the IPAs and the hazies. We've and, always we just got into those really hard. Yeah, and, and still and am actually. It's but. it's just one of my favorite flavors. But we have done. We did the Count Chocula. Oh, we did Count Chocula with Count Chocula cereal. We've done. Yeah, um, and, the, and and we the and Christmas beer we made. We know how difficult it can be to to really perfect the the amount of roasting you're doing versus the because we had Andy do uh he did a, some of them yes yeah for with us. the coffee we had a coffee stout that Andy actually roasted the coffee for which yeah. was awesome and yeah he did a great job it's like a perfect dark brown color but it had like the stout flavor with the coffee back finish it was nice it keeps you up all night you know yeah. you <laughs> get a Andy, buzz Andy again you know he uh just a, a coffee genius a, a yeah. guru of all things beans. I mean, this guy's a if he, he, he's he's awesome. Yeah, he's he's definitely good, a sweet biker too. Yeah, he's a he's a good friend, just a good guy all around. I yeah. mean, he's just a cool dude. Um, but yeah, this one is a uh, Kringle Monster, and you know, I want to say one more thing before we uh, leave this beer review is uh, if any of you get into home brewing, you know, Wisconsin is the best state to get into home brewing. We have Brees Malts. Yeah. in Chilton, Wisconsin, who make the best malts. They roast them to perfection. Like, they'd have all these machinery that's, like, more advanced so they can get, like, the color you need, the caramel color. 
they'll make base malts. Just a great company. Wisconsin's lucky in in the beer making. Let's yeah. be honest. Yeah, and uh, if you ever need advice or or uh, if you have questions or anything like that, reach out because we both know uh, a, a pretty decent amount of of what home brewing is about and and what it's like. So if you have questions or uh, want suggestions or even if you just want to reach out and tell us what you make and and send us some of your uh, uh, batch uh, uh, ingredients and um, recipes, that'd be awesome. For sure. All right, y'all, it's that time again. Another story of how many locals you at? That got fucked right there, That was weird. That was dumb. That was all right. All right, cool. Uh, So this one is kind of neat. Uh, Not necessarily in the way that we like it to be neat, but uh, this one's strange. It's different than what we've probably had before. Uh, a little on the scary side. Yeah, honestly, yeah, this one kind of went viral recently, too. So we had a feature in it. So. so if you haven't seen the video, um, it's on the interchange in Milwaukee, like right after you get off uh, the bridge there. Yeah. And uh, a car was caught on on camera the Sunday, and she's facing charges. Officials released a video of a, uh, the moments a 27-year-old woman drove off a bridge in Milwaukee County. The, the county sheriff's office said this woman launched off a freeway snowbank on the side of the road Sunday. Her vehicle then dropped on the ramp of the uh, interstate that was below it. So it was like 40 yeah. feet down roughly. I think it's 40 to 50 feet, they said. Yeah. Roughly. And, and, hey, uh, if you haven't been on the on the interchange in Milwaukee there, uh, uh, it was designed by a really cool engineer uh, or they don't call them engineers it's when a, they do. Def- it's a civil engineer, technically. It's a civil engineer. Yeah, okay. it'd be a civil engineer. So uh, they're really cool that there's like multiple tiers, and all of them go different ways, and it kind of looks like a roller coaster. So if you fall off a of one, it's likely that you could hit another <laughs> yeah, below yeah, it. Yeah, yep. So that's what happened here. I mean, she really got lucky. Let's be honest, because that's that's the that's the yeah. highest one and going back towards Madison. It's, it's one that raises that's above. That's the top one. That's the top one that raises off towards Madison. So you're going west. And all those ones are new. Uh, I think if I'm if I'm thinking in the right area, I'll I'll go up and I'll see it. But yeah, so it's the one right. She did survive. Yeah, it's the one before you go right to downtown. It splits off where you can go to oh. uh, Green Bay. It goes to Madison and it goes uh, to downtown. Hilton, okay, yep. so the Hilton's in the background. I see yep, that now. Exactly. So this one isn't new. This is relatively new, but it's not the newest. It's not the newest. The one. newest is the Zoo Interchange. Yes, but she did plunge. Um, uh, uh, officials are saying the the police officials are saying that uh, she was under the influence of alcohol. At the yeah, time, so it so. says that the investigators believe that the uh, the woman was under the influence of alcohol at the time. She has been charged with uh, OWI. And they did find blood in her alcohol in another article. I found. They found blood in her alcohol? They found... <laughs> oh, Shit. man. She is really screwed she, up then. I mean, probably did, there probably was blood from that fall. I'm going to be honest Now, real quick you, so. question before we get into yeah, how seriously. many loco shit. How much alcohol do you need in your blood in order for it to be blood in your alcohol? <laughs> That's a lot, baby. Okay. So like point point three. So let's be honest. Is so, the level that I think that I at think that so. point you don't you say you got a little bit of blood in your alcohol there <laughs> instead of being like you know how they say, you get in an accident and get a little blood in your beer that's yeah, opened in remember, the car. Yeah, so. Remember when you know if you <laughs> oh, if you put cheese on your chili and somebody's yeah, yeah, like oh yeah. would you like a little bit of chili with your cheese you fucking monster uh, that's what we're talking about here. Yes, yeah, so we're talking clearly about had. There's uh, blood in that more alcohol than blood, and here we are. Yeah, I mean, forty foot plunge. There probably was a little alcohol in her, uh, or, or a little blood in her alcohol from forty foot. Know. I'm going both ways. I'm switch, switching this up here. Right? <laughs> yeah. What was this, she? This Kringle's wrecking me, dude. <laughs> I'm to be I honest, nine percent, baby. Woo! It feels like we're sucking down a full Kringle in it's, each can. It's, it's awesome. It's so good. But, but yeah, also. so she's 27 years old. Um, we don't have a lot of background on her. We could probably look it up and find out more. But I think it was just a young woman going out to party. She didn't realize the conditions were this bad. Um, well, and, yeah, because it does say that she uh, used a snowbank as a ramp. Here. Yeah, she went um, Dukes full, of Hazard, full Tony Hawk. This is the Milwaukee version of Dukes of Hazard. She actually went Andy. She was on a like a, a BMX bike. Oh yeah, Ooh. hell yeah. Um, no, but for real, uh, she must have been 
I mean, I'm enough just, to veer off unless she was texting or something. It, but it, it's something totally distracted because even drunk, when you're on that thing, you're you're gripping the steering wheel. At least well, I am. Here's the I thing: am. when you're going, oh, oh, like through that interchange section, where uh, if you're going like towards Milwaukee or towards Madison or to, you know whatever, at all of those different spots, it's like a hard. It's a curve, yeah, a hard curve. It, it comes pretty quick. And they so that's have, normally like, that's area and territory for you to be full eyes on road, two hands on wheel, and you're making that, that curve until you're in your straightaway, and then you can, you know, adjust the radio or, you know, right. whatever. In my opinion, uh, alcohol is is definitely the thing that's distracting and making it feel like I can you know, I can do whatever I want here because I I can I have full control over this vehicle, and it, it, the amount of loco that you would need to be on at this point doesn't necessarily need to be high. I don't think it is. I, I was actually not thinking exactly because sneaky it would be. This is a high. You know, she launched off a bridge. No, I'm thinking this is probably just a quick distraction. That's what I think. So. I'm thinking. Do you want to do another three, two, one? And sure, let's you, do it. I got, okay. I got mine. So go ahead. All right, three, two, one, eight, ten, eight. Loco is what yeah. I was thinking. I mean, a couple. I mean, she was out maybe for a couple. I really think she just got distracted and she didn't realize conditions were that bad. And when you get around that curve, there's a sign that says slow down to forty five. And she probably didn't even, even look at the it. Curve, yeah, they, she probably didn't even see it. You know, she probably on her phone. There's flashing lights. Young girl texting her boyfriend or whatever. I'm not, I'm just making assumptions here, you know, just, not just situationally. She's texting someone and she's, you know, not necessarily paying attention. Or again, you know, that, that sneaky alcohol feeling of I've got control of this. It's not a yeah. big deal. And I mean, like her falling off that bridge is why she got the OWI because she's operating while intoxicated. Even she might've been below the limit to right, be honest, right. but because she crashed her vehicle and, and, and again, there's alcohol in the system, you I, get one. And you know? I do want to remind everybody in the state of Wisconsin, 0.08 is the legal limit. However, that doesn't mean that if you're below 0.08 that you can be driving a vehicle and not be charged. Yeah, if, if you you're can be charged at driving, 0.04, if you're still suspicious, like suspicious, or yeah, like, yeah, definitely. If they believe that your that your driving is impaired to any level, and they think it's you know uh, alcohol or drug related, and in fact, I've seen cases where people are are. Uh, convicted uh, even just on caffeine. Oh, for sure. You suck down a five-hour energy and you get behind the wheel and you're all jittery and shit. Easily, you can still be uh, uh, convicted, charged and convicted for an OWI uh, because, again, OWI is just operating while intoxicated. It doesn't say intoxicated on what. It's just a controlled substance is all yes, it is. Yes. It could be, uh, Again, caffeinated, it could be a prescription drug, it could be something, uh, uh, you know, the, the narcotics or anything related. So, so Eric, I think we got to meet in the middle here. This is going to be a nine loco. Nine loco sounds great. We'll split the difference. Yeah, there. do you want to sound the gavel, Eric? Oh, yes. All right, today we're here with uh, Matt Bray from the Millbillies. Matt, how you doing? Not too bad. How about you guys? Not Good. too bad. We got a couple brews in the system. Yeah. It's a great Sunday. It's uh, not too bad outside. So uh, how about yourself? Yeah, not too bad. I mean, for the end of February, you can't beat this, right? Can't oh, beat it. Right, exactly. No polar vortex, so we're happy. Yeah, here, no so. more snow right now, at least for the next <laughs> week, I see. So we're good. Yeah, it's Wisconsin, so you never know. I'm sure Wisconsin, you know, That's also winter, true. But... If you don't like the, the weather, just wait five minutes and it might change. You know, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's Wisconsin. So, yeah, Matt... Can you tell us a little bit how you got into bluegrass and a little about your background? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I actually got lucky. My uh, my dad, he's a he's a real bluegrass nerd too. He um, he played in a band called Pike Creek, which they played all over southeastern Wisconsin too. So I kind of grew up thinking that everyone's dad was in a band. And I realized <laughs> like, it really wasn't the case. So. And those guys are kind of like weekend warriors, uh, like we are in the sense that they all, they all worked and had jobs and stuff. But uh, at one point, I mean, they were up to like gigging like 75 times a year. So Wow. They, yeah, they were pretty busy. And then, you know, I guess I've always loved bluegrass, but when I was like 14, it's not necessarily the coolest thing in the world. So, right. Uh, I was really into, I was really into punk rock. Me I too. Kind of mohawk and yeah, me both too. Both of us, yeah. Yeah, we were both into that stuff. Yeah, right? What are some of your favorite punk 
Oh man, well, so many. So like, to start, it's like so Blink One Eighty Two was kind of like my entrance into it. Uh, absolutely. But but Blink One Eighty Two led me to like No FX. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say No FX. Less yeah, all than all of the harder ones. Just too. so many, just variety. It's yeah. Just, but then, then the I, pop punk I, was like the thing that I stayed in. It was like Newfound Glory. Motion City soundtrack, Blink One Eighty Two. It was like those ones were the yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. That sounds like my it sounds like my youth. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. It's it was like late. It was like late in high school, but we were both in the music. And uh, yeah. I remember No Effects. I got introduced. Um, what Melon Collin? We just had yeah. so many cool bands that we listened to back then. The Benjamins. Like, the yeah. Benjamins. Oh yeah, we're, okay. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, like in the, the early two thousands, Milwaukee had like a really good. Uh, strong like hardcore scene. Like, there were like, a bunch of really good bands. Here, yeah, so, Promise like, my Ring. My buddies and I we used to, yeah, we used to beg our, you know, beg my mom and my buddy's mom to load us in the car and drive down before we had driver's licenses. And, yeah. You know, different, time, <laughs> yeah. And, different time, they would make, put, you know, make sure we had 20 bucks in our pocket and we'd leave the town here for a while. <laughs> That's so. awesome. For, for yeah, merch and a brew. Yeah, right. I don't know if they <laughs> do that anymore today. But, no. Uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah. But yeah, so long story short, so yeah, I was you know, 14 and had a mohawk, and bluegrass wasn't necessarily the coolest thing on the planet, but that may have been just due to some of the rebellion against my old man, you know? And then uh, yeah. I kind of fell back in love with it, like in my 20s. Like, yeah, man, it's completely different. You know, it was always there, but it's just like, I don't know, like a couple of records fell into my lap, and I'm like, man, this is, I forgot how cool this music is. And uh, my dad had bought me a mandolin when I was like, 16 and I never touched it. It probably went along with, you know, eight moves over my late teens and early 20s. And I dug it out of the closet and started playing on it, and here we are today, you know? That's, I guess that's kind of it. Yeah, that's 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 awesome. I mean, I I wasn't raised in a music family. Uh, my grandma was a pianist, but I I kind of took to piano originally, and then uh, I just got really heavy in the music and just I, I pretty much I'm I'm pretty much open to all genres. I don't know about you, Eric. I mean, there's a few well, that I thought your dad was a, a drummer. He was a drummer of, of some yeah, sort. Yeah, I mean, know. he like never really liked music, but it's mostly He's not my John grandma. John Bonham, but I mean, yeah, I heard <laughs> yeah, he was yeah. a drummer. Yeah, and uh, um, yeah, we kind of that's kind of the same upbringing too. It's like my grandma was a pianist, and I, I grabbed a guitar and immediately fell in love with it. Honestly, it's more than anything. It's yeah, just, same yeah, same kind of. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so I, oh, no, I was just saying. <laughs> this, is, this is the this Midwest. This is the Wisconsin Midwest. This is the Midwest. This is the thing. Oh, right? No, you you go ahead, Matt. What do you got? I was just gonna say, you know, when you grow up in those music families, it's almost. You're kind of you're fighting against the uh, against the current if you're if you're not gonna play. Yeah, you know, it, that's how it was with me. There was just tons of instruments laying around the house. So yeah, and it's, that's exactly same same kind of scenario with me. Uh, my my dad was in uh, uh, Vietnam. It started uh, singing in a lot of Vietnam kind of era war music kind of stuff and performed yeah. at at Summerfest in a, in, a, in a couple different bands or in, in the early '90s and. Uh, I have a bunch of different, uh, you know, mixtapes and stuff of him uh, recording and jamming with people in uh, in uh, uh, Chicago area, and then in early, you know, early '90s in the Wisconsin area, and it just, it, 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 like you said, it just sort of seems like you're you're sort of fighting against the current. Eventually, you're going to pick something up and you're going to play. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so Matt, how? <laughs> How did you how, no? How did you find so? How did you get into the Millbillies and uh, just give us a little background about about the music you're playing now? Yeah, sure. So um, Pat is the upright bass player. He and I are pretty much the founding members. We uh, I met him through playing softball. We were in like a bar league Monday night um, slow pitch softball league. And he was over having a beer one day, and he mentioned that he had an upright bass. And I said, yeah, "Excuse me." <laughs> that's so, uh, not what you hear every day yeah like, bring it over and play man like i've been looking for a bass player for a while and it took some convincing but eventually he brought it over and uh i think he had such a good time that he, he just kept coming over and kept coming over and then um we went through a few different members here and there and then uh i found i found a guitar player actually through uh a classified ad okay cool yeah yeah Ad that I made on Craigslist, just looking, hey, do you need a guitar player? And he came by, and then uh, we found Joe the fiddle player and Dan the banjo player at there's a bar in River West called The Gig. 
It's like right on Dowson and Wright. Yeah. And on, and on Sundays they have a they have a bluegrass jam from one to four. That's kind of like it's a spot to go for sure. I mean, there's a lot of really good musicians there, and it's super open. It's super fun. Anyone they welcome any and all, any you know, right. level. Come That's... on down, and everybody just kind of plays together and met those guys there and kind of just twisted their arm until they came over, had beer, and played with us. And sometimes we're charming guys, man. Once, once, <laughs> yeah. once we get you there, <laughs> we know we got you for good. You <laughs> once, know? once you've got one of your drinks in their hands, it's like, <laughs> hey. <laughs> Yeah. Now you're on our territory. We've got to get our foot in the door. Exactly. Know, that's get the our case. Foot in the door and keep getting them to come over. So and that's that's kind of how it started. And before you know it, Joe shows up one day and says, like, "I got a song. I wrote one." And awesome. They kept coming, man. So Isn't that that? All the rest of us to get to writing and. That cool moment. Here we are. I mean, and you've you've experienced this before. I guarantee it, Matt. But that moment when you're in a jam, and then. It's like it's it's going really well, and <laughs> you happen to look over at you know in in my case it's like I look over at the bass player as a guitar player, and you 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 can't help but smile. It's just oh, like going sure. well. It's yeah. so infectious. It's You're like, just like holy shit, this is going so yeah. well. <laughs> I can't even help but yeah. smile at your face, and none of us are talking. None of us are singing. It's nothing. It's just, it's a jam. It's in the moment. And then all of a sudden you just look over at that person. And you're just like, oh my God, this is going really cool. Like this is going yeah. in a place I didn't even imagine. Yeah, yeah exactly. It was hundred percent. It's clicking right now. You know, it's just like, yeah, that's, that, that's, you know, if, if trying to explain that to people who don't play music, that's hard. It, it seems like they peripherally get it, but like, it's hard to explain, but yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. It's, it's such a, it's like playing music with people, especially like, you know, acoustic music or any, you know, anything that doesn't involve too many computers. It's raw. Yeah. It's, it's like real. real. It's just, it's an ancient feeling. Almost. Yeah. You know, it's like you're creating these, essentially you're throwing out vibrations of sound waves out with a bunch of other people. I don't know. There's just something so communal about four or five, however many people are there, three, four, five people, six all playing their part and it all just creating this and you couldn't do it without everybody being there. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just like, I don't know. It's so, it's it's like a, it's so different than any other type of communication that's verbal or, 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 you know, that that anything that's nonverbal kind of feels this way where it's just like, you have that unspoken bond of, of it being great. I mean, so tell me about, like the first Millbilly show, like I know that everybody remembers their first concert. So, you know, as, as a performing musician, tell me about that moment. Hmm. Well, with, with the current lineup, I want to say our first show was actually, it was at Washington park Wednesday. Okay. I don't know if you guys are familiar. With yeah. This. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it was, uh, it was just, I mean, I've played other shows with other people, and it's, it's, it's went well, and it's been fantastic. But this is like those particular four other guys, just like you're talking about, it just clicked. It just felt different, you know. And I'm sure compared to now, if you were to go back and look, it was it would just be so different because we were just getting started. But yeah, and if you're talking about, it, you just get that smile on your face, and you just yeah. know, like this is it's like special, you know. So, so the song we chose was Hoods. Can you uh, tell us a little bit how that song came together? Yeah, absolutely. So Joe, our fiddle player, wrote that one. Um, and it's kind of his, you know, pitfalls and perils of dating in Milwaukee in three different neighborhoods. Uh, the first neighborhood being the east side, the second being River West, and the third being um, the third ward. He never really fully says it. He kind of hints at it. He likes to kind of people can figure it out but uh <laughs> yeah 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 so yeah he showed up he showed up with it and was pretty much just you know the bones of the song and then pretty much the way that, the way that we write is usually one person will show up with the melodies and chords and an idea of what they want to do we'll play it a few times and that's when everybody else starts kind of thinking about like what can i you know what can i put where we, we call it baking it yeah, you know, yeah. Throw yeah. it in the oven. And see how, yeah. Sometimes it takes. Sometimes it takes two practices. Sometimes it takes three months. But 
they all kind of bake at their own speed. So yeah, we uh, we putzed around with Animal, putzed around, and then in the middle of it, we just started jamming one day, and we're like, well, we gotta, we don't really do this too much. Like, why not put a jam in the middle of this? And That's what's always cool. Really, yeah, yeah it, he came up with some like really tasty, tasty banjo licks. So I was like, well, why we gotta do it? Damn. Yeah, so. The old string snare drum. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it, it's crazy yeah. because I, I love the album. It was so hard for me and Eric to choose, like, what song we were going to choose. Kept, so every time I listened to a new song, I was like, this is the one. And then I, then the next one come out, and I'd be like, this is the one. And <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. eventually Hoods just became, like, the the de facto, the, the one that I kept coming back to, I guess, is like the, well, I really like this one. Like, I just, <laughs> yeah, I just yeah. really, like, I enjoyed it. It's a catchy tune, and it's probably my favorite on there, and I'm not, I didn't even write it, so yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's yeah. It's a catchy tune, for sure. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, no, we, 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 I listened to it all the way up north. Uh, we just drove up to uh, Cornucopia, which is, like, the northernmost town, and uh, it was on my radio pretty much blasting out. It was awesome. Yeah. Um, now, you're, that, you're a historian, too, right, a- a- as far as yeah. kind of just – world goes and and uh i mean i want to have you in studio at some point in order to sort of discuss certain topics but also i mean if we find ourselves with instruments you know yeah come and jam out with us yeah heck yeah of course okay cool it would be it would be a tragedy not to all right sounds good yeah you you pack your instrument and you come in the studio and you uh hang out with us uh but uh be there for sure man just let me know the topic awesome uh, oh yeah heck yeah all right, so before we let you go, we ask every guest, uh, how Wisconsin are you? And uh, we want to make sure, I'm sure you're going to do great, but uh, here we go. Gonna Eight to ten questions. <laughs> all right, all right. So the first one we got um, for you, um, have you ever been to Summerfest, and do you have a, a memorable band? Oh, I've definitely been to Summerfest. Yeah. Ooh, memorable band. Hmm. It's a toughie. It is. I've Always. seen so many, me- so much music there. You know, yeah, and it's like, do I want to go? Is it the one that I had the most fun at? Was it the one I was the most like? <laughs> yeah, the, the one you were most drunk I mean, at. I seen a lot. Of my, <laughs> seen a lot of, I'm sorry, what? I was gonna say the, the one you were most drunk at. Right? Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, that's certainly that's certainly been <laughs> one too. I'll tell you this: I I had a you know what you know why Summerfest is the best because I had a blast team ludicrous there. Yes. No way. Awesome. Team. That's what I mean. I had a blast team. Uh, um. Jack Johnson and Ben Harper there. Yes. And I had a blast scene, everything in between. That's you know so... what I mean? It's like... Yeah, I, I, I it's completely... It's eclectic. It's kind of got something for everybody. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. Like, I'm pretty eclectic. There's only very few genres I don't listen to. And, uh, yeah, I'm the same way. Like, if it's something like, oh, man, that catches my eye, I'll be there at yeah. Summerfest, honestly. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, I've, some of the best shows I've ever seen were just walking by and stopping, and there's, like, seven people there. But I'm like, oh, that sounds good. You just catch before something. Before you know it, yeah, like, who the hell, who the hell are these guys? Yeah. <laughs> I've yeah. never heard of this guy. You know, and it's a couple of like it's a couple of older dudes playing real understated, sitting down. But you hear some blues versus like, oh wow, I had no idea. You know, so Summerfest is such a gem, and growing up here, again, it's one of those things I just assumed everybody in this you know city that they were near right. had something like this, and it's like, no, not really. It's kind yeah. of a special thing. It's a bummer. I think you know, I know they're kind of teetering on the idea of what they're going to do with it this year. It's such a bummer, man. I'm so ready. yeah. It's like scheduled for September or something. Yeah. All right. So I had an, so the next question, uh, have you ever tailgated at a Brewers Packers or a Badgers game? Oh yeah. I, uh, I had a pretty good string there going to every opening day. Yeah. I made it to all the two of my twenties. Awesome. Two years I had to work that I couldn't get off. That's awesome. I'm a total (laughs) brew crew fan. So that's sweet. Opening day is like the most, uh, (laughs) That that's also a, a totally different environment too. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. A buddy of mine and I we used to get the ten game pack, and then we would probably go to like an additional five or ten a year. We were yeah. We used to, we used to go a lot. Now that I'm, I'm working full time and playing in the band a lot, it's not quite as easy to sneak out. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yep. I feel you. To, I'm either glued to the TV or glued to the radio listening to Eucharist. So heck yeah, absolutely, man. All right, so next question I got, um, Matt, uh, where do you consider to be up north Wisconsin? Anything north of the Rocky County. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That, but that would be an no, answer. I wouldn't go quite that far. I wouldn't go quite that far. But oh man, anything more than like an hour and a half driving up in Milwaukee for me, I'm like, I'm starting. Like, yeah. Get up like, past Green Bay. I'm like, this is up north, right? Yeah. Exactly. Honestly, Maybe. in reality, it's it is. I mean, my my old answer used to be. Anything north of the Dells, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I exactly. and I realized that that was a little like, <laughs> uh, maybe I was just giving everything the up north title. But to be fair, north of you is north. Yeah, no, and exactly. so like it can feel like that sometimes, right? Yes. Yeah, it, it that's exactly it, and and like there's no good answer on that. Like when I was a kid, Wisconsin Dells, like Eric said, and then now that I've like pretty much traveled the entire state it's like rhinelander right past rhinelanders up north you know yeah. it's like, past oh, rhinelander yeah. is I mean, fucking oh, canada yeah, for christ's sake yeah right that's real up north yeah, yeah. that's a whole other world up there it is you know i always say too like up north is more of a feeling than a location too right because like Ooh. i feel like you could find spots you know 20 minutes away from milwaukee even like it's got a small lake that you can do some fishing it's got that kind of that bar, you know, a bar with that up north feeling. You get a really good old fashioned and a fish fry for seven bucks. Like that's up north to me. You so, know what I mean? You know, is is up north a place or is it a frame of mind? That's just it. There yeah, you go. exactly. You know? There you go. And okay, that's the essential question. Right? <laughs> it is. Yeah, exactly. It could be the essential song that we're working on. Who knows? <laughs> hey, when you come there over, you we're writing this one. I already got a melody, go. so I'm good. Up, up, go. up north frame of mind. Holy yeah. smokes. There, there we go. <laughs> All right, so we got to ask you, you too. <laughs> I do, yeah. Have you ever been to a supper club, and uh, do you have one that you recommend checking out? Ooh, I mean, I certainly have. Because if you've lived in Wisconsin long enough, you've certainly celebrated, if not one of your birthdays, definitely yeah. one of your grandparents. <laughs> one of your grandparents, <laughs> for sure. Yep. You know, there's one in the town I grew up in. I think they just recently closed, which is a shame, but I I loved it. Now, it, it was called the Port Hotel. It felt like of an era gone by when you went in there. You know, nothing had changed the entire time I <laughs> yeah, ever went yeah. in there. It, the same uniforms, the same, you know, green, ugly tablecloth. Everything was the same, but it was perfect. Yeah, you know, that's the that, best prime rib around. So I guess that would that would probably be my favorite one. But honestly, any of them, they're all. That's such a nor, up, like upper northwest or uh, upper midwest charm thing. You know? Yeah, honestly, if the if the mood is uh, kind of dim, it's a little bit on the the dark side, and uh, you've got some sort of a weird relish bar with uh, d- weird cheeses and crackers and stuff <laughs> yeah. that you got to go grab. That. That is that it's the supper club vibe, and then like you said, the cocktail, some sort of a oh, brandy yeah. old fashioned or you know something. Yeah, you yeah, nailed absolutely. it. You nailed and it. That, and that smell of cigarettes, even though you haven't been able to smoke. Yeah, there exactly. For like years, Forty years ago, like <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's somewhere stuck still in the uh, weird linings of the walls. What What do they say? Right. Like marketing. Uh, yeah, fake fake wood walls and taxidermy all over the place. So yeah. <laughs> it's just and a how it is. It's been there for home, thirty man. years. That sounds like a perfect perfect way to get dinner. You know exactly. <laughs> so Matt, I got a, the next one. I got two more for you. So the next question I got um, for beer brats. Uh, do you have a beer that you use specifically for beer brats? You know, I worked with a lady who insisted that you use non alcoholic because she okay. you know, she called it alcohol abuse. To use, oh, to use. I see where she's Which, going with you that. Know, a part of me is like, I hear what you're saying, but I've always felt like, you know, Miller High, you know, Miller Highlight always does the trick right. It's a good it's beer. Local. It gives a nice taste to it. It's not super strong. It's relatively affordable. You know. Yeah, it. it but I you know, use that that and the big old onion. It's it's a cheap beer and it's very flavorful. It'll definitely soak in your broad. It's not a bad beer at all. I'm telling you too, and you hit on a good point there with the onion. A half a stick of butter, at least. I mean, I'm <laughs> yeah, telling you, oh yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it right in there. Ridiculous oh, yeah. the amount of flavor yeah, that you can get out of that. What do you guys use? Yeah, same thing. So most of the time, it's really just what's the oldest beer in my fridge. Um, That's a good point too. Yeah, right? yeah, recycle it out. Exactly. What's the skunkiest thing that I got on my shelf here? Or recently, I've I've honestly been trying. 
uh, even the the craftiest of craft beers and ambers have been uh, pretty pretty delicious. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're definitely good. And I, I, for me, it's, it's a cheap beer. Um, I, I like to use craft beer when I can, but otherwise PBR is my go-to Paps yeah. blue ribbon. Nothing wrong with that. It's cheap. It's, it's, it, it has a good skunky. flavor. It gets a little skunky, but it's great in your bra. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, you know what? I'm gonna have to try the amber and I'll get the PBR go too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, so Matt, we got one more question for you uh, before we let you go sure. today. Um, have you ever been to a brewery tour, and do we have a favorite or a memorable one that you recommend? You know, honestly, I've never been on a proper brewery tour. Okay. Oh man, you. you and I always to... like to say it's. it's I, I always like to say it's because I was born in Milwaukee, and so I, I think it's just in my DNA. You know. Yeah. But you were basically we giving like brewery some, tours. Exactly, you're not lying. But we've played a couple of breweries, and I've been in the back. I've just never got like a proper right, a proper tour. You know? Well, well, Matt. Next time uh, you come over here and we uh, jam out here, maybe we'll hit up uh, Lakefront and a couple other really cool ones, just to give say, you an experience of some really but, cool ones that we recommend. We and, could probably uh, even like yeah. film uh, uh, some sort of a lakefront brewery tour with you know with Matt. From yeah, Gilbert. heck Let's yeah! Do it, man. That, I'm a hundred percent down. That'd be a great way for me to uh, experience your first. Heck yeah! That's yeah. The, it's the best tour. And uh, yeah, Matt, thank you so much for your time today. I know it's a Sunday. Oh, yeah. We really appreciate it, and uh, yeah, you got to come and be a guest host. We got so many cool uh, historical things coming yeah. up, and uh, we'd love to be have you involved. Yeah, no, seriously, guys, thank you so much for uh, for interviewing me. This, is, this has been fantastic, and. Uh, yeah, I can't wait to come in the studio. We can talk some history and have a couple of beers and do some picking and go for yeah. it. Right on, Matt. Absolutely. Man. Have a great Sunday. Yeah, you too, you guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, no All problem. Right. Bye, Matt. Thanks. Bye. All right, bye. All right, that concludes this episode of Wisconsin Drunken History Podcast. If you enjoyed this vulgar display of Wisconsin, please like and subscribe on whatever streaming platform you prefer. And remember to hit the bell on YouTube to be notified when we release new content. Also, if you have any suggestions or ideas for future episodes, please send us an email at widrunkenhistory at gmail.com or head over to our Facebook and Instagram pages. Thanks again for listening. And remember, as always, watch out for deer on your way home.